Welcome back to Army Matters Top Chef Competition, where we're going to find out who the better cook is amongst our two hosts. In one corner, Lieutenant General Leslie Smith, and in our other corner, SMA Dan Daly. The hosts were assigned the task of creating a meal to be judged by Restaurant Impossible's Chef Robert Irvine. First up, SMA Dan Daly. So here's the meal I submit to you. Hand-tossed, homemade smoked pizza, mushrooms, the nice mozzarella. I'm talking the quality mozzarella, a little bit of tomato, some basil, oregano, touch of salt, a little bit of olive oil on the outside of the crust, which garnished with some Parmesan, lightly toasted and then put in the smoker. And then I'm gonna top it off for your side dish. One of my home brewed beers. And I'm thinking an IPA, kind of nice finish, little bite up front, but a flowery notes of some of that good hops that I put in afterwards. Chef Irvine seems impressed, but what does the competition think? Really? Pizza? And the beers aside? Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> I, I get the juice. Yeah, I get it's, the juice. I get the juice. It's good, bro. Let's see what General Smith is able to come up with. How about uh, a nice Atlantic salmon with butter and lemon with appropriate seasoning? I like slap your mama seasoning with uh, a nice garnish of artichoke or... Uh, or some some green beans. And since I have to have my starch, uh, a little rice. And, and my favorite dessert is, is chocolate cake, uh, along with a, a nice cup of coffee. Of course, you know, since we're having fish, we have to do, I think it's a, a white wine with that. Uh, we, could, we could pick and choose what those are. And that's my submission. Both impressive meals. But what does Chef Irvine think? So here's the interesting part. You both chose two very different meals, right? One, uh, Leslie is more of a dinner meal. Um, and Dan is more of a after dinner with a pizza that sounded, by the way, you, Dan, you use very eloquent descriptive words of your, your product. <laughs> Which, yeah. if you were on Food Network, you would win hands down. Oh, yes. Not on Food oh, Network. Oh, my oh. gosh. So do we have a winner? We're not on Food Network. So okay. I right. would say you're both <laughs> on winners, both delightful meals. But if we're looking at healthiness, it has to go to less. Thank you. Right? All right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dan, I would eat that with you at your house uh, in the mountains any day. Yeah. But Les, I would too. today you're the winner. Uh, thank you. Thank you very oh much. Oh, my God. Thank I feel you. like I just got beat by Bobby Flay. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I just got beat by Bobby Flay. But the descriptive words were amazing. They I, were. I was I was getting hungry just thinking about all right, I'll the oregano I'll and I'll everything be, that he put on there. I'll accept it. It's not the it's, first time I got beat up by oh, Chef that's, Irvine. <laughs> that's, 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 that's very true. We could talk about that, too, as we, we coming up. We uh, will. But we got yeah. to the, we gotta get to our yeah, guests. Yeah, we do. We got to get so, to our guests. So let's, let's talk about uh, what are you? I don't know about you, but choosing between our hosts two proposed meals seems like, well, an impossible task. I mean, pizza? Salmon? But luckily, our celebrity judge, Chef Robert Irvine, has faced many daunting challenges over his career. Starting out as a cook in the British Navy at the age of 15, Irvine's gone on to become the host of numerous cooking shows, notably the Food Network's Restaurant Impossible, as well as the owner of multiple restaurants and businesses, an author, and a speaker. On top of that, Chef Irvine makes it a priority to travel across the world and organize events, and yes, meals, to give back to the Army and military. In today's episode, our hosts sit down with Chef Irvine to talk about his own military roots, the value of service for young people, his recently released book for entrepreneurs, in an infamous cook-off between Chef and SMA. I'm Carrie Varro Heikes, and I think it's time for lunch. I mean, this is Army Matters.
Drama, drama, drama. That's all they want yeah. is drama. <laughs> you know me, I don't do drama very well. <laughs> okay, yeah. You just beat people up. That's right. Even with a smile. Hey, so Dan, you want me to take first? Yeah, you go ahead. Take lead. Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie C. Smith, the Army's former Inspector General. And today, I'm joined here with my co-host, my battle buddy from the Pentagon, Dan Daly, our former Sergeant Major of the Army. Dan, how are you today? Sir, you know it's always a great day to be on a show with you talking to great people. Yeah, brother. Me, I am SMA retired Dan Daly, and I now have the honor and privilege of co-hosting a, a podcast. Did you ever think you'd be here unless... Uh, no, I never did. That's why I have this mic in front of me, I guess. But seriously, one of the things I really like about being your co-host is meeting great people like today's guests. Oh, you mean the guy that's on the show today? Yeah, the guy that's on the show. You mean that they want to listen to more than just you and me? Yeah, yeah, uh, they have to. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. This guy is uh, is awesome. Um, former military. Yeah. A celebrity. Yeah. Most of the listeners on here and a majority of our service members across all the services already know this guy. Yeah. And, mm. and he's humble, too. And you know what? He's a good, good person, good friend. You know, I have this little book. You know, I got this little book of people book. that I uh, am going to beat up someday. But, okay. But also in that book is the people that in the middle of the night, if you called me, I don't yeah. care where you are in the world, I'll come help you. Okay. He's on that list. He's Matter on fact, that list. He's on, he's on the okay. top of that list. Uh, well, I, I think we've talked enough. Let's go ahead and introduce our, our guest today. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have Chef Robert Irvine. Chef, how are you doing today? Sir, how are you? It's good to see you. Yeah. Dreamboat Daily, SMA. Yeah, baby. Oh, come on. Don't jump on the boat with these guys, sir. Come on now. <laughs> but it's true. Listen, if you've got to wear a name, you got to wear it. And and look, hang in there. It, it's worth it, right? Because you yeah. are one of my, my all-time favorite people <laughs> in the world. And you just said something nice there. But oh, the, my way gosh. You, the way you were at SMA, 15th SMA of the Army, was spectacular. People loved you, and I'm not blowing yeah. smoke. I don't need to. Yeah. Um, you're making me. You're making, you making me both. blush. You're making and me blush. You yeah. very well, which is, <laughs> which is amazing. And thanks for having me on the podcast. So you know we're all friends here, but our listeners got to know that there was a very heated moment between Dan and Robert. I think it has something to do with a cooking competition. Can you describe to our listeners what happened? Who won? Oh, you go in there. All right, so I did have the honor and privilege to be on stage with Celebrity Chef Irvine at Fort Campbell. Um, chef came down graciously and gave his time to our soldiers. And we came up with an idea of battling me, battling the chef on stage. Now, here's, here's honest. I can't boil water. I can't. But you know what? I'm an infantry ranger. So you don't take a challenge lightly, right? So the rules were, and that's how I remember it, um, after he got done with a chef Irvine live, we could each have a sous chef and he has an awesome sous chef, great human being. And of course I'm outnumbered. I got a, a real sous chef and a celebrity chef against an infantry guy. So I decided to pick the United States army chef of the year to be my sous chef. And again, I don't know anything about cooking, so I didn't do anything on stage, but try to badger chef Irvine while he was trying to cook. So my guy could get a little leg up. And unfortunately, we did a blind taste test at the end, and I somehow lost, which I think was rigged, but I'll let Chef tell his side of the story. Well, let, let, let's, let's be honest now. This is a <laughs> show that I do all year, and, and, and I want to set the stage, okay? First of all, they took my knife away. They took their heat away, they, and I did. was handcuffed behind a rather large gentleman. Mm -hmm. So they had all the knives and the firepower and the this, and yet I still beat <laughs> SMA daily with, you know, like one hand time. In fact, it was two hands tied behind somebody else's back. That's um, actually true. No, actually true. no heat. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying that I'm an infantry guy. I'm a Navy guy. But I did win, I believe. But I will tell you this. He did get me back at a Garrison East event on stage doing push-ups. And it was two minutes to do as many push-ups as you can. We had individual people holding uh, or counting. And I thought I did great push-ups. At the end, when I, when I, you know, I thought I did more than he did, uh, somebody that was, oh, it was an army guy. There's a surprise. Uh, said, oh, you did like crocodile push-ups. <laughs> you know, yeah. like only halfway down. Yeah. So yeah. it's actually online, Irvine it is. versus it is. Daily. Um, 
it was pretty funny. Um, but he got me back on the push-up contest. I so, did, I did. You I know, did. there you go. I lost fair and square. I lost fair and square. What I'm really saying is the 15th SMA is a dreamboat. Okay, chef, you got to make him blush again. Now we get that out of the way. Before you became the celebrity chef that you are, before any cooking competitions or anything le- like that, let's jump into your service, your service in the British Navy. Normally we don't talk to people in the Navy, but I guess we'll make an exception for you since you, you take care of so many soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. What do you think, Dan? Since we won the football game last year, yeah, we'll. Oh, yeah, 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 we did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you joined the British Royal Navy at the age of 15. Yes. Um, I was not a good kid at school. Okay. My brother was in the Army. My dad was in the Army. My brother was um, in the Royal en- Electrical en- Mechanical Engineers. My dad was a sapper. And then my brother went on to, uh, to fly helicopters and other things. But- okay. So when my mother would go to work, I would double back, wave the royal wave, and then double back and drink my dad's beer uh, with all my friends. Not a smart choice because my mother called the house. I answered the phone like an idiot, <laughs> and it was the demise of Robert Irvine. Um, oh, wow. Be, to, yeah, I was a sea cadet from 11 years old, which I meant I would go to bases and, and, yes. and ships and warships and weekends, uh, and I loved it. And she sent me to the recruitment office. And the recruiter said, well, congratulations, you're in the Massachusetts Royal Navy, and you're going to be a cook. And really? I went crazy because I loved home economics. I loved okay. cooking for folks. So I, it was a perfect job for me. And I went, young kid. I actually set foot on my first base at 16 years old. So your father was initially opposed to you joining the Navy? Hated it. He wanted me to join the Army with my, <laughs> okay. it was my okay. brother. Yeah. Um, and for two years, and this is a very true story, I wrote this in my book, that he didn't talk to me for two years by joining wow. the Navy. And the only time he started to talk to me is because I worked for a two-star admiral as a cook in, uh, in the house. Yeah. And the admiral had a party and invited my mother. So I was in Flag of Support Smith. Um, he sent a car to pick up my mother, and my dad showed up in wow. the car. Not wow. a good move. I'm like, oh, you know, what what's going to happen in this scenario because we hadn't talked for two years okay because he felt that cooking was beneath our family interesting servitude didn't like it okay he came saw what i did then him and my boss became friends and Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it was a call to be a cook in the navy yeah that's amazing amazing how that one meal can change a lot of discussion so give us uh one or two important lessons that you've you learned during your Navy service that you still apply today? Well, I think, look, I have 11 companies, 5,264 employees. Okay. And uh, very big revenues. Um, And what I learned from the military was uh, leadership. And there's four things that that come in that leadership. Number one is empathetic leadership. What does that actually mean? Um, know your squad, know your people, know their strengths, know their family's weaknesses. In other words, I may have an autistic son. I may have a wife with cancer. You better understand the people that you work with. That's the first thing. Then the egos, their egos and, and yours, uh, losing both. Then uh, trust and authenticity. And they're things that the four pillars that the military taught me, which I use every day, in my, in my business world, business is set up like the military with a CEO and then all, all um, silos that go beneath that. But like the military, uh, especially the army, because it's the largest of our force, I think I use middle management, our senior leadership, uh, our sergeants, our, our master chiefs, et cetera, just like you would uh, um, I give them autonomy. I don't tell them when to work, how to work. Here's the mission. Here's the direction. Uh, let's go and get it, right? I don't tell them how to do it unless, you know, I need to. But but I think that's the strongest, one of the strongest things that, that, that Dan always, I got from Dan uh, many years ago was NCOs are the key to success in everything, right? And I've allowed that to happen through our business. Chef, that's good. Now, in the Navy, can you tell everyone what your biggest challenge was? 
I didn't have a childhood because I loved the military so much. So 11 years old to 16, I would go away on weekends and, and um, aircraft carriers and ships and, and Marine bases and special forces bases and all those kind of things um, as a sea cadet. And when you become 16 and you, you sign on that line, all of a sudden you grow up and become a man. Right. Whether you like it or not. Right. You have to. And I think that's the biggest thing that it taught me is there is a relationship between, you know, the leader and the follower. Yeah. Uh, and it's really important that you have that trust. Look, I went out a few nights and drank a lot of beer and, and got into trouble because I came home late. My, my, as a young man, yeah. I was supposed to be on base at 12 o'clock. And, and I had this and never forget this. And you could never get away with this nowadays, by the way. Sure. Um, but I had a exchange warrant officer from South Africa who, when I came in late, gave me an option, either I'm going to beat you up or you're going to go on the captain's table. And I said, well, you can beat me up. That's okay. So he did <laughs> literally. And I'm not kidding you. So it was kind of interesting because every Tuesday we had to make amends, which meant we had a sport, we had to play sport. Yeah. And the only way I could get him back was playing soccer, five-a-side soccer, or okay. football in my word. Um, and I would pummel this guy in every wall and every floor I could get him just right. to get him back. Yeah. But I learned my lesson. Don't come in after midnight. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I'm going to pull the thread a little bit, Shep. So um, you talked about your love of cooking at a very young age and how the Navy brought that to life. I know this story because we sat down and had some beers over it before, but I don't think you've really publicly told this story. How does a Royal, a Navy person get to become a celebrity chef? That's not overnight. So can you quickly talk about the journey that you shared with me before? Yeah, it, it's so funny because, and literally, I, I wish I could, I'm going to send you this because I just got this. Somebody sent this to me and I don't know if you can see that, but right there is the Prince and Princess of Wales. Mm -hmm. And right behind there in the middle up here is me. <laughs> wow. Somebody sent me that. You have some 30, hair then, Chef. After 30 years, somebody sent me this. Wow. Um, and in them days, we never did pictures. But but look, I started off as a cook, warships, bases. I worked with Prince Andrew when he was flying in Portsmouth. And then when I came out, it was really hard for me because unlike the United States, there was no transition program. It was, you've done your time, see you later. Um, so I started cooking in a hotel. It's a Division Three football club. Um, did pretty well there. Played soccer. I was not a football. I was not very good at it, uh, so it didn't last very long. Um, but then I saw an advert in a, a newspaper um, for a chef on a ship. I thought, well, that's got to be easier, right? I'm in the Navy. I know a ship. That's easy. But it was a cruise ship. Uh, I joined Celebrity Cruises in Miami as a sous chef or executive sous chef, number two in charge of this, you know, huge ship carrying 2000 plus people. Um, I did six months. I was pretty good at it. Became the executive chef, did that for, well, I don't know, two or three years. Uh, then I went to Jamaica to put two hotels together, did that for a year. And then um, Island Life didn't kind of suit me because it was too laid back and I was too militarized to say, you know, I, it was kind of interesting because the island taught me a lot of patience. In Jamaica, if it rains, there was no buses to get the folks to work. There was no, there was nothing. So my first encounter was the Jamaican police telling me that I had a gun in a hotel. Uh, PJ Patterson was the prime minister, and I used to cook for him on weekends at his residence when I wasn't at the hotel. Um, and he was the one that kind of helped me so I stayed there for a year, and a year and three days, I got a telephone call from a headhunter. And he said, hey, um, Donald Trump's looking for a, a number two at Trump, Trump Taj Mahal. And I said, well, you know, I've got a little ways to go here before I can leave. But I flew into Atlantic City, uh, waiting to cook for him, actually, and forever and ever. So I arrived one day, I'm going to cook the next day. My flight out the next day was at 9 p.m. He didn't walk in the building till 6 p.m. So Atlantic <laughs> City to Philadelphia is an hour. There's no way I'm making that flight back. That's right. But I cooked for him. Um, just and, and it was literally things out the refrigerator to make a meal. 
like a, a mystery basket. Um, he offered me the job. I went back to Jamaica. I resigned. And I hadn't had a day off in a year. So they paid me $30,000 in cash, which was great. Wow. Yeah. So I went back into Trump Taj Mahal. I went undercover for four months. What does that mean? I didn't put a chef's jacket on. I didn't put pants. I literally came in at 6 o'clock at night. And I sat in the bathrooms. I walked the hallways. I did all this thing because at that point, uh, 1997, there was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of, um, I, yeah. I give you how bad it was. We would buy a trailer of King Crab's legs. And by the time I went from the third floor to the first floor, a cab had already backed up and took it and gone and there was no footage. That's how bad the theft was. Bad it was, yeah. It was yeah. ridiculous. The, the casino was doing $784 million a year, and the food and beverage was doing 15.5. And Trump said to me as a number two guy, hey, I want to make more money. Yeah. At the end of that first year, he said, look, I'm going to give you storerooms, purchasing, and food and beverage. Well, we did. I made $83 million that year. Wow. Um, Huge increase. Like, okay, you take over. You take over everything. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> and I stayed there four years. I was doing local television every Sunday night. I would do a thirty-minute show on local television for um, cooking. Was that a cooking show? Cooking on segment, yeah, cooking, yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I used to get two thousand emails a week. Oh, can you do this? Can you do this? Eventually, uh, I met a guy named Mark Summers from Double Dare. He said, "Oh." Why, why don't you do TV on a national scale? I said, well, I don't think I'm good enough, whatever, whatever. Um, he came to watch me at a live event, said, yes, you you should do TV. Uh, it took a year. And it's funny because we kept pitching all these shows and nothing came except a year in my life of what I do. It became a show. Originally, it was called um, Fit for a King. And mm -hmm. then it became Dinner Impossible. Dinner Impossible did 240 episodes. It was a number one rated show, but it's really hard on the body because you didn't know what food, what equipment. In fact, there was none of either and just figure it out. Just like you do every day in the Army and Navy Air Force, right? Yeah. Just you figure it out. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. And it became a national hit. It went from, from 22 minutes to 42 minutes per episode. And then they said, okay, what's next? And I said, well, I, you know, I think restaurants. How do we help restaurants? And Restaurant Impossible came. Again, it was a 30-minute show, 22-minute show, became a 42-minute show, and it's literally just finished after f almost 14, 14 and a half years. Wow, it's been going that long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Join AUSA, the Army's premier professional association and host of the largest land power exposition in the United States. AUSA is open to everyone, including all ranks and components. So whether you have a relationship with the U.S. Army or simply want to honor those who serve, you can learn more at AUSA.org slash join. So, Chef, yeah, and I've, I've known you for years, and we could talk about the things that you've done. You know, you already talked about um, the most important meal is one you had with soldiers, and it didn't really matter what the menu was. It was just the opportunity. But we also know you as a celebrity chef. So what meal have you not mastered? And be honest. Now. Oh, yeah, yeah. there's a lot. Yeah. Dan oh, Daly, yeah. oh, you little beast, you. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. This is, this is a lot. Look, I, yeah. I've... Oh. I've had some great experiences in Afghanistan, Iraq, mm -hmm. Poland. I just come from. It's not mastering; it's having the time to, to really make it special. You know, sometimes, and you know yourself, when you get mm -hmm. dropped in somewhere, you've got this much time, and then you re you review it afterwards and oh, I should have done this, but I didn't have the time. Yeah, um, I don't think it's mastering because once you've mastered heat which is turn the dial down or put more fire on or and the knife skills. The rest is just, it doesn't matter whether it's a hundred or a hundred thousand, it's just numbers. So I don't think it's anything I've, I've actually not mastered. It's things I would have done better given the time or had the different equipment or, you know, I never forget this. Um, I sent the first battalion, second Marines uh, to Iraq for the first Iraq war. 
and they said to me, you're going to do a warrior meal for a thousand coming off uh, 29 palms. And they said, we've got high powered equipment. It was a water heater. <laughs> and I used it to make tomato. It was a water heater. Yeah. And I used it to make tomato sauce. Yeah. Well, little did I know that it was going to catch on the bottom and start burning, right? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 you know? That's the crunchy part, though. Marines, pro- Marines probably like that. That's the crunchy part of the sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they yeah. didn't know. So it was okay. <laughs> Good. So every time I go somewhere now, I just fed 10,000 a couple of weeks ago at uh, San Diego Naval Medical Center. Mm hmm. So I, I think it, you just get better at doing things. You know, it's like when you first learn to use a rifle yeah. or clean a rifle. The, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I think that's cooking. Now, Chef, that's really good. Now, I, I know you spend a lot of time and effort in your foundation, and I really find that fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? I'd worked with many um, foundations, the Sinise Foundation. Mm-hmm. I met him online 16 years ago, I was going to Honduras to Sotokana Air Base to do a 4th of July party. He was going to Alaska to do a concert. Mm -hmm. He broke down. He tweeted me and said, is this a real Robert Irvine? I said, is this a real Garrison East? We became friends. Um, I said, if I I can help you, let's do that. So we do these Invincible Spirit Festivals or hospitals around the world, uh, military hospitals. And... uh, and then one day I said, well, it's great, but I've been making millions and, and doing great things with Gary, but I wanted to do more of, of mental and physical health. I didn't want to build yes. houses. I didn't want to. So I started a foundation eight years ago, the Robert Irvine Foundation, which is primarily based on mental and physical health, well-being. Yeah. We have programs that, that not only feed, we have all these different um, uh, programs that we send folks to, in fact, I just got two, two uh, guys back from a psychedelic place in Mexico uh-huh. uh, for post-traumatic stress. We just spent their $6,000 each to send them, and they came back completely different people, it was, yeah. and, which I believe the DOD is about to authorize that kind of uh, psychedelic treatment. But I think really it's because I wanted to do more and, yeah. and not just put somebody in a house and say, hey, look, I give you a house. I just put 750 Marines um, together uh, since first time in 20 years after Iraq. They lost 250 of their uh, brothers and sisters. Yeah. And we put a big cross in Pendleton and big dinner. So I, I think the foundation is a peace of mind for me to continue to to help those look, those invisible wounds. Um, yeah. Is you see a leg and you see an yeah. arm and you see burns, which is, is tragic in itself. But what we don't see is, you know, people use that number, that 22 number, which is way wrong, by the way. Um, And I think we can do a better job of helping um, senators and Congress and and, and the government understand that just because we're not in Afghanistan, Iraq or somewhere else, there are still those invisible wounds that that are carried by our servicemen and women today. And I think that's why I wanted to start the foundation to do more. Okay. Well, well, thanks for sharing that. That's that's very important. You know, you've written a new book. You have five books that you've written so far. And the latest one is a guide for entrepreneurs entitled Overcoming Impossible. Why why this book? I wrote the book because we would get 2,000 um, requests a week to do Restaurant Impossible, and I could do one. Wow. Um, and, and bearing in mind that I work with you know, probably the top 20 fortune 500 companies mm-hmm. on leadership and, and, and what we do in the real world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, so I've done cookbooks, I've done fitness books, mm-hmm. let's do a business book and see if this helps. So w- when I sat down with Matt Tuttle, who is my editor of my magazine, I said, look, I want to make it. So it's not do this, do this, do this, and you're going to be successful. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about my losses and my wins that I call mm-hmm. LMWs. And all the people that I've worked with over the restaurant and possible seasons and whatnot, that almost like a blueprint to failure because you stood on a landmine. And I don't yeah. mean that. Uh, no, I understand what you mean. Metaphorically. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this book based on experiences of 330 episodes of, of a show with yeah. 93% success rate. Uh, after wow. I've left, you know, uh, wow. my, my biggest one being $1.1 million in debt doing 3.4 million today. 
Wow. So I wanted people to understand, and I mentioned those four pillars earlier about how to mm -hmm. be successful. That's very good. So, you know, as we close, you, we've talked about a lot of things and you've done a, a lot of great things as a supporter of, of, of our servicemen and women across the world. So how do we inspire young people to serve? And I'm not just talking about military service. So give us Chef Robert Irvine's viewpoint of that. I think when you wake up in the morning, and, and this is, look, we're going through this amazing time right now of, of division in our country for whatever reason, yeah. right? We only see negative press in our military. We, yeah. We've seen all those things. And then you see the moms and dads say, well, no, we don't want you to serve in the country because this may happen to you. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to, we've got to educate the parents again, re-educate. Yeah. We've also got to be, be better at our, our payroll or, or, or salaries, our housing, our mm -hmm. benefits. It's not only about serving the country, which I truly believe we've, we have done, right? But it's also about bringing the, the military up to modern times with the feeding platform, with the, with the benefit platform, with the housing platform, all the things that Dan and, and yourself talked about many years, many years. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I know that for a fact. We've got to get better at that. So remember, years and years ago in the 60s, uh, there was a brain drain to America, right, from the mm -hmm. world. Everybody mm -hmm. had that was great. Let me bring them here. Look, we can offer anybody um, great opportunities. And the military, for me, is the best opportunity in the world. Mm -hmm. Where else can you get paid, get housed, get clothed? Get a meal. Not only a meal, but, yeah. but get trained into something that you want to do. Yeah. There's no other company in the world that does it as well as our army. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there isn't. They're used to it from years and years and decades and decades. And once you've served and you understand teamwork, you understand teamwork, and you yeah. understand teamwork, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's because good. Because the outside world doesn't have that. So I would say yeah. to anybody that wants a trade, that wants a little excitement, wants yeah. to travel, wants to meet great people and befriend great people for the rest of your life, then this is for you. If you feel that, that, that look, you're not good at anything, the army will, will make you good at something, right? <laughs> yeah. God gives us all a gift. That's right. Some people don't believe they have a gift, but yeah. we have it. That's right. And it takes the army or the military in general yeah. to get it out of you in a very specific way. Look where I am. I'm a, I'm a cook. I'm a cook running successful companies because I served and I, I got taught how to do it. Yeah. Well, Chef, we're really glad the Navy made you such an outstanding cook. Despite the fact that you can't do push-ups nor select the right guy to win the Chef cooking contest on this show today, but we're also glad that you're an incredible human being. Unfortunately, our time is up, but Chef Irvine, I want to personally thank you because I know how much you do for our service members all across the world. Thank you for being an incredible human being and thank you for honoring those who serve. Well, I thank you for having me. Keep doing great things for our soldiers, and uh, we'll catch up soon. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the Total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, and anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Dale Call is the producer and writer and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Barrow Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five-star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. 
The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm with Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hooah.